we're in Exodus. Exodus is a great book. Second book of the Bible. Finding authentic freedom. How many of you, since you have come to Christ, you would, you would have experienced something tangible in the area of freedom? Freedom, Not just a concept, but a tangible freedom in an area. Can you just lift your hand and look around? <clears throat> and let me ask you this. How many of you are contending for freedom in an area of your life? Can I see your hands? Okay, that's what this book is all about. Exodus means the way out. Everybody say way out. It is the way out. It's what is it the way out of? It's the way out of bondage. It's the way out of slavery. It's the way out of captivity. It's the way out of oppression. It's the way out of oppressors that keep people in bondage. It's the way out. Jesus said we must enter the kingdom of God through, everybody say through, through many tribulations. So we are going to go through it. Exodus paints a great picture on how we do this way out. It's a book of transition. It's a book of movement. It's a book of momentum at times. It's a book about the splendor and majesty of the glory of God. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great book. It's, a, you know, the way out. It's, you know, Exodus is where we get the word exit. You know, we have exits right over here, right over here. If you don't like this message, at any time, you can take the way out. The front, the back, you can take the way out. I hope you don't. This book is about God delivering his people. When you think about Exodus, and if you've seen the movies, the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston back in the day, and all, you tend to think it's just a, a relocation of a lot of people, and it is that, but it's much deeper and more significant than that. It is about the deliverance of God's people in every area of their life. It's the deliverance in the area of the, their spirituality, how they view God, how they walk with God, how they interact from God, where they had, you know, treated God as a mere um, theology and dogma, if you will. Now they would experience God. They would, they would know God experientially. You know, it, it really is a, a book about deliverance mentally. How many of you have some thoughts that you are glad aren't on display all the time? You know those thoughts I'm talking about? Yeah, those thoughts. So it's a physical, it's a spiritual, it's a mental deliverance. And what you see happening in Exodus really is mirrored in the New Testament through Jesus. Everything in Exodus points to the one Jesus who said, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said, I am the way. And so I want to talk to you about some mindsets how many of you know that most of the issues in our life, most of the problems that we face, most of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, really about 90% you can track to the way we think, a mindset, a, a habit of thinking, which is why, you know, the New Testament, especially the Apostle Paul is so adamant about renewing your mind. You know, he said, you know, put off the old man, put on the new man, which is created in Christ Jesus, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. Let there be an exchange that takes place. You know, Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 12, don't be conformed, squeezed into this world's mold, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Go through a mental metamorphosis, if you will. Find the lies, expose the lies, let the truth pound them out, which, you know, one of the Hebrew definitions of the word wisdom is to pound. It's good. You find a lie, you pound it out with the truth. That's how you experience freedom. So this is good. This is the transition point of the book, Exodus 13 and 14. This is the, the key moment, the pivot point in Exodus. So let's pick it up in verse 17, Exodus 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the way of the Philistines, though that way was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God let the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle, which to me is really funny. Uh, it's just, one, once again, it's one of those little nuances there. Israelites went up ready for battle. You know, they had really never fought anybody at any time because they've been in slavery and bondage for centuries so the fact that it just kind of says they were out ready for battle, the rest of the book will tell you how not ready for battle they were. Right. I mean, seriously, they couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper sack. That's the reality. <laughs> I mean, that is just 
Plain old truth right there. So I think, you know, once again, you just got to kind of look at that and go, ready for battle. Really? You're, you and I are going to say there's no way they were ready for battle. Here's the first of five mindsets I'm going to give you. I would write them down if I were you. The mindsets that we need to go through to transition. How many of you know where you're going is unfamiliar territory? The, the place you and I are going isn't necessarily a predictable path. And God really never tells us to, to plan out your future at the expense of today, where Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God today, and everything else will take care of itself. You know, I, I think the discipline for the body of Christ is, how do we live in the moment that God wants us present in right now, and, and, and how does God want to be present in that moment today, and not future trip, not get out extended mentally and emotionally uh, in fear, or worry, or anything, you know, but just stay in this moment. Here's the first mindset. The first mindset is I will choose, and this is, this is a mindset, I will choose to trust God's goodness instead of my own logic. Now, how many of you know the Lord is good? If, you know, the only way that you and I can trust is if we spend time with. When you spend time with somebody, you know their character. The more you know them, the more you walk with them, the more you listen to them, the more you see how they react will describe the quality and quantity of their life, and then you base, can I trust, can I walk with that person? Critical in marriages, critical in the kingdom of God. I trust God by getting to know God. And so when I see scriptures, i got to marinate and meditate on them. The Lord is good. And I, I would say, you know, we need to personalize it. When you see a verse that says, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, it really helps to say, the Lord is good to me. Yeah, I mean, it's there, and it's written a long time ago, but it's personal. This is a personal letter from God to you and me and the body of Christ from all ages. The Lord is good to me. In fact, I think you ought to say that right now. The Lord is good to me, and his mercy endures forever. The Lord is good to you. Yeah, Francis, to you. The journey, remember he said he led them. On the way of the Philistine, they didn't, he didn't lead them the shorter way. He led them the longer way. Why? Because God is after a deeper work and a deeper walk. You know, I mean, if you look at the, the, how short, is there a map? I don't, is there a map? Let's believe for a map. There, hey, there's a map. What do you know? You know, you, the, the way, the short way would have been right up there, Goshen, Ramses, suck up, and just right up there, bam, to Canaan. That's short. That's about a two-week journey. But we have to remember that God's plan, is, it's his design for their deliverance. It's, it's not their invention. And so God's desire was, you know what, we're not going to take the shortcut. How many of you know most of the time shortcuts end in not good? So he says, you know, we're, you're not going to be shortcut people. You're going to be long-term sons and daughters. And that's going to come with a daily walk with me, says God. And so, you know, you look at this and you think, wow, could have been two weeks there. But instead, it took 40 years, 250 miles. You know, I mean, if the Israelites were writing the book, it'd be, you know, how to ruin a short walk and make it really long. I mean, right? I mean, how many of you, you know, you, you, you suffer from hurry sickness? Oh, come on, God. Come on, God. Hurry up. How can you? No, you know what? It, this is a long walk. Our journey with Christ is a long walk. He's not in a hurry. We shouldn't be in a hurry. Why? Because he's got some good stuff every single day. He's got newness of life every single day if we'll simply walk with him. You know what it says? Psalm 18, verse 30. As for the Lord, his way is perfect. His way. See, that may not look like much, but that's the perfect way. The perfect way. As for the Lord, his way is perfect. His path, his journey is perfect. When Jesus said, I am the way, it's perfect. It means it has integrity. It has wholeness. It has a sense of entirety and completeness. That's the way that we walk on. As a Christian, you know, when, when Paul was hunting down, or Saul was hunting down Christians, you know who he, who he was looking for? Here's who he was asking for. Find the people of the way. The persecuted ones were people of the way. So that first mindset is you and I have to choose to trust God's goodness instead of our own logic. Exodus 14, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi-Hahirath. Yeah, you know that. 
And you know where that is, too. It's between Migdal and the sea. And it's in front of Belsephon. You know, household words. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. That's the point of the whole book, that his people would know that God is God experientially. And they did so. Exodus mindset. That's what I'm calling this, Exodus mindsets. Number two, I will embrace testing to reveal my fears and my convictions. How many of you know testing always has a purpose? How many of you were really good test takers? You know, when you know, the teacher commands said, we're going to have a test today. What did they call it? They used to call it a um, no, pop quiz or was it? Surprise test? I, I can't remember. It was, it was dreadful. But they would just, you know, say, we're going to have a test. I know guys that actually love tests, eat tests for breakfast. They're, the, they're freaks. They're the people, they don't study. And they, they see the T word, got it. I do. I know people. I mean, highly educated. They never studied. Me, study, study, study. Wonder if I'm studying the right thing. Hope they don't ask me the wrong thing. See the T word, test anxiety. That's a proven. It's actually in psychological journals. And there's a pill for that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Jesus, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the bailout. <laughs> So imagine going from people who are afraid to be tested to knowing that God is going to test us, and it's something to be met with anticipation and not anxiety. The other, the place that he led them to, if you look on, on a map, Pi Hehirath, um, there's nowhere to go. I mean, there's water on one side, there's mountains on the other side, and, and you're thinking, man, that is just a bad place to find yourself. And it is unless God led you there for the sole purpose of displaying his glory to you. See, they, it, they, they are not clueless. Where they find themselves, it's like two and a half million people have only made it a week. It's a week. And they're looking and they're going, okay, here we are. And there's the water and there's the mountains and there's nowhere to go. And we know that they're coming for us that way. And that is by God's design. When you and I cooperate, in fact, you go through the whole book of Exodus, and you will see when people cooperate, cooperate with God, things go really well. When they don't cooperate, they complain, and bad things happen. Cooperate, good things happen. Complain, bad things happen. <laughs> Write that down, man. You get a tattoo, okay? Cooperate, good things. Complain, bad things happen. Now, here's the deal. I would love to just read a book on maturity. I would, you know, how to be mature in Christ. Read the book, underline a bunch of stuff, highlight, call it good, read the book, I'm mature. The problem is that's not how God wires us. He wires us to test us, to bring us to places that we're really unfamiliar with, to see what's in our heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and he loves to get you and I to these moments that really demonstrate how much we need him. Now, how many of you can just think right now in this last week, you had some immature moments. Just be honest. You had some really immature carnal moments. Raise your hands. Um, Francis, what would that be? Would you just share with us all <laughs> there? No. I'll, I'll share a couple of mine. Can I just be honest with you? And it's embarrassing. It's horrible. Don't, don't do like Bob, okay? You know, I mean, seriously, I was golfing. Uh, well, I wasn't golfing. I had a golf club in my hand. There was, ball, there was a ball, but it went in the lake twice. So as any mature person would do, he threw his club <laughs> really hard. <laughs> and it went underneath the golf court, and I, and I saw the look on Francis's face, and I thought, oh, that's a bad move right there. That was a bad move. It was just immature. I thought, wow, how old are you? 61. How old are you acting? Six. Throw the club. Why don't you just snap it over your knee? done that, but that was a long time ago when I was really immature. But it just showed me. It's like, my God, oh, come on. You know, immature. Then I applied for a visa to go to India. <clears throat> you know, those applications are from hell. 
pages and pages and pages of detailed, all kinds of things. And they, and they emphasize, don't make one mistake or it will be rejected. And so, you know, test paralysis. Uh, and I'm filling the whole thing out. I'm getting proofreaders to come follow me up. Smart young people, man. They come alongside. I go, just make sure this is filled out. They go through everything. Fine tooth comb. It's good. We pray. I send it in. Now, now I hear nothing, 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 nothing. And, you know, I got to leave like in a week and a half. Probably should have prepared a little earlier. But flunk that test too. So get the thing back. No. It's been returned. And one reason, the one reason was because my surname and my given name, which I'm not really sure what that means, doesn't match my passport. And I just got furious. Does it really matter? Hasty, Robert Earl, Robert Earl, hasty, give me a break, India. I mean, really. Really, and I'm, I'm telling you, man, I, I threw a fit, threw a club, threw a fit. I like to throw things, okay? <laughs> and it was like, are you kidding me? And this is a simple test. I'm going, Jesus, I'm going to another country. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be a good thing. I came and passed the test of a visa application. <laughs> and I'm, I'm whining. I'm pounding. I'm blaming India. I'm not liking India much. I'm like, come on. And then I get my head right, and I get my heart right, and I repent. And it's like, okay, God, and I resubmit it. And it comes back yesterday. Oh. It came back. So I'm going to India in a week and a half. Pray for me. Okay, but there was a flunk, okay? I flunked. I get it. I flunked, and you flunked too. And you know what? We get to take it over and over and over and over. How many times do we have to take the same test? The answer is as many times as it takes for you to pass the test. All right. It gets worse. So here's God's heart. Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. Now, I love this, okay? Remember the whole way. That the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Okay, this is Deuteronomy. It's the second recounting of Israel and the Exodus and the commandments. Led you these. Remember the whole way. Just remember that God is not leading you like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then you get days off. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. No, no, no. God is leading you the whole way. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. The question is not, is God leading, is am I following? He said, let him the whole way, that he might humble you. Once again, I, I, humble, man. Humility is not at the top of my you know, wish list. Can I, oh, give me some more humility. But that's what God says. He wants to humble them, testing them. To know what was in their hearts, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you. And he let you hunger and fed you with manna. Do you know that sometimes the leanness in your life is by God's design and not your own doing? And you know that there's other times that it is irresponsibility that leads you to leanness? But you need to understand this whole thing is about God's design for deliverance. And God saw fit to let them experience some humility and some hunger and some leanness so he could feed them, so he could wean them off of a, a slavery mindset, of an oppression mindset, out of a dependence on taskmasters and walk with God. That's the whole design right there. And do you know how much God gave them, gave them every single day of their life? Just enough. Now, us Americans, we think just enough is a whole ton of stuff. Man, read, read the word, man. Be very content. The prayer at the end of Proverbs, Lord, help me be content with what you give me, and don't give me too much because I'll forget about you, and don't give me too little because I might steal and do something stupid. So our prayer for finances, for prosperity, for wealth is always God Give me what I need and help me be a blessing to other people. Okay? That's that. Thank you for those three. Yeah, and a couple of holy murmurs. That's okay. That's good. We're going to get through this. So, what, so this whole, the whole point here of, of the Exodus, and I love this. And this, I can tell you emphatically, this is part and parcel of God's will for your life. And it's to always to bring you and me to the end of ourselves. This is a geographic end, but it's much, much deeper. It's more revelatory than that. 
God is looking for people come to the end. Because what happens when you get to the end of yourself? Usually something creeps in called desperation. And then something leaks out called desperate prayers. And if you look through scripture, man, those desperate prayers get great answers from God. And so sometimes, you, once again, you got to cooperate with the, the end of yourself. That's what the cross is. That's what the crucifixion is. That's where Jesus said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. What's he talking about? Pick up the instrument of death. Pick up the instrument of humiliation. Pick up the instrument that crucifies your past life and don't go back. It's a good life. Bring you to the end of yourself. To me, it's always, you know, the, the, the picture, and it's, and it's retold several times, but it's where Jesus teaches up on the, up on the hills, and, and thousands of them are listening, and the sun's going down. And you remember the story, but the disciples go, hey, it's getting late. Send them away. So they, they're hungry. Send them away. You remember that? Send them away. That's logical. That's a logical thing. Send them away. They're getting hungry. There's no food. What does Jesus say? Mm-mm. Wait. Back up. How much do we have? Little kid comes up. What is it? How many loaves? Five loaves, two fishes, not much, okay? You know, we're not talking about loaves and fish on steroids. We're not talking, you know, 200-pound tunas. I mean, we're talking just a little, just a little bit. And, and you remember, here's what one of the disciples said. He said, Lord, what is so few among so many? That's a logical answer. You do the math. You got some crumbs, got some fish. See all those people? But in God's heart, you know what it is? You know what? I can just tell you. Here's what Jesus is thinking. This is so by design. This is so by design. I'm going to let you guys just kind of hang with that uncomfortability of hungry people and looking at the natural resources that aren't much. And, yeah, I'm just going to let you feel, feel that weight and, you know, maybe let a possibility come in there. And Jesus, all right, bring them to me. And you know the rest of the story. What does he do? He takes what they give him. He lifts up his eyes towards heaven. He gives thanks. When does, you know, I wonder if we have gratitude on the front end of lack, if somehow God doesn't, you know, just kind of watch it. Because gratitude ahead of time is really a faith statement. Typically, we're grateful for what we have. But what if, what if we're grateful for what we don't have yet? I, man, I, I think that's money right there. And you know the rest of the story. He does it. They're all fed and they're all satisfied. Make no mistake, God is wanting to bring you and I to the end of ourselves and our own natural resources. Let's get through these next couple. Exodus mindset number three, God will point the way and provide for our deliverance. So what does God do? He gives them a pillar of cloud to guide them, a pillar of fire to give them light. You know, so he's got the big, you know, these are not little things, man. You've got a quarter of a million people. I don't know how many square miles that would have been stretched out over. But the cloud and the fire has got to be big enough to do what he wants to do, to show his glory, give his assurance, you know, his presence. You know, once again, it's a, it, it, it's a type New Testament, you know. You, it's a foreshadow of in the New Testament. We don't have pillars of clouds. We don't have pillars of fires. What do we have? We have the Holy Spirit, the assurance that God is with us. When Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you, he gave the Holy Spirit so we would know that. And it's better than a pillar of cloud. It's better than a pillar of fire because he abides on the inside of us. Oh, good stuff right there. Exodus mindset number four, resist the temptation to the easy way back to the familiar. Uh, once again, these things are all common to all of us. When things get hard, historically, we go back to what's easy. Even though bondage was hard, there's still a way you know how to deal with it. I can't tell you how many times over the years you watch people make progress, make progress, and all of a sudden, man, big test, big temptation, big situation. And they go back to what was familiar. They didn't like it back then, but they go back to what was familiar because they know how to live. And the, walking in the newness of life with God every single day is a new thought. It's a new concept. Verse 10, Pharaoh approached the Israelites. They looked up. There were the Egyptians marching after them, terrified. They cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? They weren't serving the Egyptians. They were slaves to the Egyptians. It's distorted. So you start getting crazy thinking. When looking back starts looking good, you have distortion in your thinking. 
You have deception in your thing. When looking back starts looking good, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Resist that temptation. The temptation is always to go back to the familiar. You know, it's funny. You always hear that, you know, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. You know what the second shortest verse in the Bible is? Remember Lot's wife. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Jesus wept. Yeah, well, okay, let's add a word. Remember Lot's wife. What did God say? Don't look back. Don't look back. Let's get out of here. Don't look back. Lot's wife. Oh, just tempted to look back. Next thing you know, Morton Salt. It's over. Remember Lot's wife. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. That's distorted thinking. You don't know what it's like to die in the desert. You haven't died in the desert. How can you say that would be better? But once again, you start reaching back for yesterday. You start reaching back for the past. It gets crazy. It gets nuts. The familiar. One week out. They've been on this journey one week, and they're ready to just cave and go back. Fifth mindset. Last one. Remember, reflect, and obey the last thing that God said. Here's what Moses would say. And in fact, let me just say this. You know, one of the things that stood out to me in the previous verse is they, they, they get in fear. They're terrified. They pray. That's a good thing, right? They pray. In the same verse, they complain. Now, how do you make the transition from, oh, God, help us. Why are you letting us die out here? I mean, how do you? Isn't it amazing how, may, I'll just speak for myself. It's amazing how I can go from pretty spiritual I mean, really, I can go sometimes from mature, almost walking on water, not quite, but I mean, there, and then literally, a hyphen separates mass carnality, mass, just horrible thinking, you know, doubt, unbelief, that close. Can any of you relate to that? Don't leave me hanging up here all by myself. I'll do it if I have to, but how many of you can relate to that? Pray in one minute, out of control the next minute, complain. Good, this is the nine o'clock service. Thanks for being honest. Saturday night, ah, they don't get real honest sometimes. Like, no, I come off of it. I don't know how to do that. It's like, oh, me, you? No, it's just you. Okay. <laughs> Remember, reflect, and obey the last thing. Here's what Moses answers the people. Don't be afraid. Okay? Number one, don't be afraid. Stand firm. You will see. Oh, this is good. This is, you know, Exodus is much a book about leadership development as it is deliverance of God's people. So if you're a leader in any capacity... Man, rummage through Exodus. There is some good stuff. Stand firm. You will see the salvation or the deliverance of the Lord. He will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Let me just tell you, that is so counterintuitive to the natural man. You know, we, we face a situation we want to, hustle. We want to get busy. We want to do something. We want to use our energy. We want to, you know, we got, there's got to be something to do. Crazy, man. Defies logic. Stand still and you're going to see deliverance. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. That's crazy. All hell breaking loose around you. Well, read a book. Go get some counseling. Go. Maybe, but just be still. You know, you know what Moses actually tells them? Here's the Hebrew word. This is great. Found this little gem. Lahe raga. What does that mean, Pastor Bob? In Hebrew, it means calm down. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I probably should put a worship CD on or something like that. Hey, I got to go do something. No, maybe you just need to calm down. Maybe you need to do Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. It's not, I, hey, there's a time to fight. There's a time to pray. And there's a time to zip it, still the heart, and in quietness, and confidence will be your strength. Let's stand up together. I want to ask you a question.
you know, for them, you know, that mindset of remembering, reflecting, and obeying is followed by doing the next right thing. The next right thing, according to Moses for the people, was to just be still and watch God do what he wants to do. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to just think for a moment. What is the next thing that God is asking you to do? And I just I want you to think about this. I'm just going to, I'm going to read off some things, and if, and if one or two or five of them relate to you, then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have people up here come forward to pray for you. Once again, be still. What is the next right thing God is asking you to do? Is it to pray? Is it to move on? Is it to stop complaining? Is it to trust? Is it to be still? Is it to meditate? Is it to obey? Is it to repent? Is it to forgive? To confront? To learn? To grow? To give? To start? Receive? Is it to look? Is it to accept? Is it to confess? Is it to heal? Or is it to believe? Now, if one or two or three of those words the Lord just kind of highlighted, would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand. Just keep your hand up. I just want to pray for you. Lord, you know that sheep are restless. Sheep are nervous. We also know that you're the good shepherd of our souls. We know there is a time to do things. There's a time to cease and desist and behold the glory of God. So I pray, God, whatever it was that resonated as the next right thing for people that have their hands up, I pray that you would give them the grace and the strength to obey that next thing, whatever it is. I don't think you tell us 20 or 30 things for the next week, two, three weeks. I think there's a right now, here the nowness of God. And so, Father, I pray that people would just not, just not walk away with a head nod, a mental assent, but they would hear by revelation and conviction by the Holy Spirit, God. And they would do. They would be obedient to the next thing. And after that, they would give thanks. And then they would move on. I love what when Moses is interceding and he's crying out to God too. <laughs> God just says, Moses, what do you, what do you, what do you complain? Tell them to move on. You know, there's a time, really, where it, just move on. Move on. Quit romanticizing the past. The good old days. Man, I, I would never trade the nowness and the nearness of God for anything yesterday. As good as it was, as great as it was, the God is doing a new thing, man. That's a real thing. So help us, Lord. Just be great followers. Help us walk through trials, tests, temptations, and all forms of adversity. God, we don't want to be like it was said in Psalm 78 of the children of Israel. Again and again, they provoked and tempted the Holy One of Israel, and they limited him by not remembering his power and the day that he delivered them from their enemies. So God, help us remember well what you've done in the past in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. If prayer people can come forward, come on, get prayer. Church, you're dismissed. I love you.